exciting program, Hollywood Goes Hollywood. And it's given by Steve Toth. <laughs> I wanted to tell you a little bit about Friends of the Sterling Road Library before we get started. All of our events are on Zoom right now and they're open to the public. If you want to support the Friends, it's um, you can go on sterlingfriends.org. That's our website and I'll put it in the chat. You can read all about our events and you can get information about um, joining the library friends group if you would like to. We have a couple new programs coming up with the Friends of the Sterling Road Library and it includes a new art appreciation series which starts tomorrow called Museums and Architecture. And it's tomorrow at seven and it will, um, our speaker will be talking about Rome and the Sistine Chapel. And we also have a new music series starting on Tuesday at seven o'clock. And it is about music and movies, knowing the score. So I hope you'll consider uh, joining some of those uh, friends programs. And um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Karen. Hi everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. It looks like we've got a nice group of people. Um, <clears throat> we're still on Zoom, unfortunately, and our new schedule is on our Facebook page and on our web page, all of the lectures for next year. Uh, we have an event on the 15th of January where we're celebrating Holly, one of Hollywood's buildings, which is a hundred years old. It was the first building in Hollywood. And if you'll find the information on our Facebook page, um, it's the 15th of January from six to eight. Also, we do historic walking tours of downtown Hollywood every Sunday, the first Sunday of every month during the car show. And that also, that information is on our Facebook page and on our webpage. So we've got a very busy schedule for next year. And uh, this lecture is going to be rather cool. Stephen Toth was born, he's one of our board members. And Stephen was born in Hollywood Memorial Hospital where my kids were born. His grandparents were pioneers in Hollywood moving here in the late twenties. And his mother was also born here, which makes him a second generation Hollywoodian. He's a songwriter, storyteller, musician, and a great asset to our board. Uh, he has sat on the Hollywood Historic Preservation Board for seven years and is also a, on our board. He states that he would be none of these without his better half, Tina Toth who is one of our alternate board members. So Steve, I'm gonna give you the pleasure and um, thank you for joining us, everyone. You're on mute. You yourself. I got it. Okay. okay. I got it. I am I am here at Clive Central. So you're gonna see Clive <laughs> Taylor listed as my name and then Clive is going to be in the hot tub once uh, I don't need his assistance anymore. I do not get the champagne until I'm finished, uh, but everybody else does. And they're, they're, I'm gonna have a loud crowd here too because they're watching out. There's a live audience outside the Jealousy windows on the big screen TV. We're having a watch party. <laughs> uh, I, I welcome you all here. Uh, I've been asked to do a lecture for a couple of years now, or at least the last year. And there were a couple of different ideas that were sent my way. And I really wanted to do something that, um, that, that was close to my heart. I'm known as Mr. Entertainment in my band. And uh, I've been claimed in the press locally as the unofficial mayor in Hollywood. So I thought it was very important for me to do something that was entertainment related. Um, I've always had a love for the Midnight Cowboy film, and this was a way that I could piece all this information together. I want to first bring up a couple of facts of Hollywood, California, 
and Hollywood, Florida. Uh, I don't know if you all know, but initially the Hollywood sign, which is behind me here, used to say Hollywood land. It did not say just Hollywood. And it basically was a giant real estate sign to purchase property up in the Hollywood Hills. Joseph Young called Hollywood, Hollywood by the sea, which was sort of another ploy of real estate sales. So we both share the Hollywood name. And uh, growing up as a kid, I always loved telling people that I was from Hollywood with a pause. And then I got to say Hollywood, Florida. And uh, I'm proud of that. Another interesting fact between the two towns is that Hollywood, California is not a city. It is only a district of Los Angeles. So Hollywood, Florida is truly a city. Hollywood, California does not have a police force. They have the Los Angeles police force. Hollywood, California does not have a mayor or commissioners. They all run underneath the Los Angeles uh, mayors, commissioners, and police force. Also, Hollywood, Florida has twice the population as Hollywood, California. So we are the big city, not Hollywood, California. Um, so with further ado, I'm going to talk about uh, some movies. And I, I particularly picked movies in the 20th century. There were many movies that were filmed in Hollywood, but I, I picked a few. And then I'm going to wander into some different movie stars and musical people that were involved in Hollywood. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to give you a little taste of the theme from Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. Okay, that's good. And we're gonna go to here. And then everybody see the screen? Can you see the screen? Okay, everyone's on mute. So how do we go to the video? You just come down here. You're gonna have yes, to we can see the screen. Okay, awesome. Exit out of that, and then it'll be up here. So you want to show that at the end? No, right now. Oh, you want to show it now? Yeah. Okay. Um, right here. Okay.
How do I go to myself? You're right there. You're sharing. They're only seeing the screen. They're showing. They're seeing the PowerPoint. So okay. See okay. All right. Did you all uh, get to hear the sound to that in the video? Awesome. Thank you. Uh, that was my band covering the Midnight Cowboy theme, uh, and we sort of reenacted one of the last scenes of the film in the movie. And uh, uh, Joe Buck, John Voight's character, ends up in front of the Great Southern when it was still a hotel. Um, and so we wanted to uh, show the Great Southern on screen one more time um, due to it not being there anymore. So we filmed that in about 2018. Uh, Midnight Cowboy. Clive, just give me another help here, how I can go to my own picture and back and forth. You mean you want to go to the next screen? No, okay. Yeah. I can. Like, but you, need, I, you I, need to go back up here. Okay. Uh, so Midnight Cowboy was filmed in 1969. Uh, I don't know if you've all watched that movie or not, but it, it has um, approximately uh, three very important scenes in the movie that are filmed in Hollywood, Florida. Um, the movie itself won the Academy Award for Best Picture of 1969. It also is the only film ever to win the Academy Award that was rated X. Uh, at the time in 1969, you could not have a gay theme in a movie. And uh, this was uh, astonishing that uh, it was award winning. Um, it is a fantastic film. Um, I, if you know the story, it is probably one of the grandest wanting to come to Florida films there is. Um, um, uh, John Voight's character, Joe Buck, is a, is a Texan that goes to um, New York to try to be a hustler, not realizing that there weren't going to be a bunch of uh, rich women that were going to pay a young stud for, for money. And he meets this character, uh, Razzo Rizzo, which was played by Dustin Hoffman. And uh, the picture you're looking at right now is a scene from the beach of the diplomat. Uh, in the movie, Dustin Hoffman's character wants to get out of New York. The weather's terrible for him. He's an unhealthy person. And he has this dream sequence that he's going to become a pool boy uh, at a hotel in Florida. And the scene that was shot there uh, was, uh, this scene was sort of a dream where they run down the beach. And um, uh, it's right outside the diplomat. So let me get a little better at going from picture to picture. So uh, during the film, they finally, uh, they get ready to come down to Florida. And this is a scene on the bus of Dustin Hoffman's character, Razzo Rizzo. Um, not doing too well. Uh, during the movie, Razzo Rizzo has this great line that really makes me think of Florida. And he's trying to convince uh, Joe Buck to come to Florida. And his line is, there are two basic items necessary to sustain life. And that is sunshine and coconut milk. Did you know that? That is a fact. And in Florida, they got a terrific amount of coconut trees and sunshine. So this is a scene on at the pool at the diplomat during the dream sequence um, when Ratso, who wants to be called Rico Rizzo when he moves to, to Florida, he becomes a pool boy. And this is at the uh, old diplomat pool and he's catering to uh, the fabulous retirees and, and, and youngins that are 
enjoying it there. Here is a shot of the very end scene in the film uh, after Razzo Rizzo, uh, he's still on the bus and uh, there is, um, um, I don't mean to give away the whole movie, but that uh, there is a murder in New York to get them to Miami. And this scene is sort of what we have reenacted uh, other than we didn't murder anybody. Um, uh, where they throw out the murder clothes and they buy new Florida clothes that are all fancy. Um, this is not a Hollywood scene, but this is one of the most famous scenes in the movie. And uh, you know, I'm walking here in New York. Oops. Hey Clive, what did I do there? Oh, wait a minute. So, okay. Uh, another scene from the film, still in New York. So this is a, a, a film still, and this is down at the Diplomat also. You can see some of the same characters that were in that other picture where he was uh, gambling uh, with the ladies. And then to finish it off, his dream is over and they chuck him in the pool. And um, Razzo Rizzo ends up dying on the way to Miami Beach after they left Hollywood. If you get the opportunity to see this film, I'm sure you can get it from the Broward County Library. Uh, there are many copies. The uh, music soundtrack is one of uh, my favorite uh, movie soundtracks, uh, uh, Everybody Talking was a humongous song uh, that Harry Nielsen uh, had recorded. And oddly enough, that song is so, uh, uh, so Florida of a song uh, with the lyrics to it. And it was actually written by a Floridian, uh, Fred Neal, who was from the St. Petersburg area. Uh, Harry Nielsen made the song famous, but it was actually written uh, by Fred Neal. Uh, Clive, can you give me one other thing? How do I go back and forth from like seeing me and then going to these pictures? You want to go, you can't see, you get, it's only the pictures are, are nothing. I All mean, right. It's a slideshow and you, we can actually see you. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I'm we cool can there. see you up there. I'm yeah. cool. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next, the next film. Uh, this film, Body Heat, was filmed in 1981. Uh, it is a great film. These first two films are wonderful films. I would advise everyone uh, to see these films. Uh, this was what was called a neo-noir film. This was a, the noir films of the 40s and the 50s uh, where they were sort of uh, suspense and detective and uh, sexy and, and many different things. And um, William Hurt and Kathleen Turner are on this film. I believe Mickey Rourke's first uh, starring, not starring role, but role is in this film. And another odd person in this film is Ted Danson. Uh, Ted Danson, this was before Cheers and he plays a very hilarious character. Um, this film was mostly shot in Lake Worth and Manalapan. It was supposed to be filmed in the Northeast, but then it ended up, uh, they came to Florida and they filmed it there. But there were a couple of scenes filmed on Hollywood Beach, uh, one in front of the band shell. And then there were a few uh, shots that were on the beach also. I have some, some uh, screenshots from some of those. They're a little dark in the film, but uh, let's see how they go. Oh, that doesn't look too bad. So this is the Broadwalk in 1981. And if you see, we did not have the cement wall. We had a wooden fence at the Broadwalk uh, at this time. A little closer picture of the two. I think that this is probably Kathleen Turner's greatest role. She's amazing in this film. Uh, this here is facing the um, the stores and I totally forgot about this until I watched the film again that there were public restrooms uh, uh, just south of the band shell um, on the Broadwalk and 
Here's another shot of the Broadwalk. This building is gone now. This is where uh, this is where Margaritaville uh, is now, uh, and the extended end to the south of it. Uh, Frank and Mario's Pizza was around this area, but it's not there. Another shot of the bathrooms. Um, and here is a shot of the band shell that's in the film. Uh, these are basically the only scenes that are from Hollywood, uh, but it is an amazing film. And it was sort of my first introduction to uh, knowing um, that there were that there, there were some films done in, in Hollywood. Uh, one more shot, of William Hurt. So now we're gonna go to the 1990s. Uh, Cape Fear was um, shot in downtown Hollywood, some of the scenes. Um, this sounded like a dream movie, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro. Uh, um, it, it just a great cast, uh, Nick Nolte. Um, uh, uh, Jessica Lang is in the film. Um, uh, some of the scenes that are shot there, and then oddly enough, it is a remake of uh, an earlier film uh, named Cape Fear. Cape Fear is actually a town in North Carolina, but they did end up doing a lot of shooting in Hollywood. Uh, downtown, especially. Um, um, this is a movie still from Hollywood Boulevard. I got to watch this scene actually be shot. Uh, and Robert De Niro did his, his own stunts uh, driving down the street, and doing a burnout and backing up, although it didn't all end up in the film. And uh, also, I got to cross paths with Robert De Niro down there. And of course he was as cool as a cucumber uh, and a little scary as he always is also. Um, I, did, I did reach out to find out the business that was behind them. And this was Michael's Discount Women's Apparel. It had been uh, downtown there since 1965. Um, and then here they would show the they would show the uh, the dailies at the old theater on the circle, which I believe is the Hollywood cinema. The building still stands right now. They haven't tore it down yet. And then they shot this one scene of Robert De Niro just being maniacal uh, in uh, this film. And so they watched the dailies there. A couple of other things, I, 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 the Rainbow Cafe had a small bit in this film and Club M. Uh, they shot a bar scene in Club M and they had offered Robert McCarthy, the owner of Club M, to uh, design a whole set inside of Club M. And um, then they ended up, they came after they shot the scene and they told him, all right, we're going to tear that all out of there. And uh, Mr. McCarthy said, oh, no, no, you're not. I'll, I'll, I'll take all those renovations. So uh, they kept all those renovations in there until uh, Club M was no more and uh, he still owns the building and it is actually the building that we're having the uh, 100th anniversary. It is part of the very first building that was uh, built in Hollywood. So the next movie is Wrestling Ernest Hemingway. Wrestling Ernest Hemingway was filmed in 1993, uh, had a great cast. Uh, they did some, uh, some filming mostly on Harrison Street and 20th Avenue. Um, not, not, not a great film, but it had a great cast. Uh, worth watching. Uh, I believe you can get this at the library also. I did, I did uh, get Cape Fear through the library. I do own this film, but it's because a friend of mine actually ended up in the film and uh, I'll explain that a bit. Uh, Robert Duvall, Richard Harris, Piper Laurie, one of uh, Sandra Bullock's very earliest films is uh, in this, and uh, Shirley MacLaine is in this film. Um, uh, here is Robert Duvall and Richard Harris. They both played two retirees uh, that don't have much in common, but they end up becoming friends. And uh, 
I remember watching this film in 1993 and I thought uh, Robert Duvall did not do a very good job at his Cuban accent. But in the end, when I watched this film recently, uh, I know a lot more about older Cuban guys and uh, I think he did a great job. So this is very interesting. So on the corner of 20th and Harrison Street, they built an entire diner uh, previous to where um, Club body tech was. Uh, and my wife and I were like, oh, this is going to be great. There's going to be a diner town town. I mean, they built the whole thing out. It was amazing. Uh, well, it was, it was, and I, I wish they would have kept that there. Uh, it was called the Sweetwater Snack and Diner. And they shot um, um, more than one, more than one scene from here. And they also shot in the surrounding areas. And what I had found interesting, although 1993 does not seem like a long time ago, uh, that they shot on Harrison Street and how much Harrison Street has even changed uh, since 1993. Um, you could see in the distance Melody Music. Melody Music was a music shop that was there from the 1950s up until after this. I mean, they still had the listening booths in Melody Music after that. I Personally, my mother bought all her 45s there, and I have my mother's uh, 45 collection uh, from 1950 to 1955 that all was purchased in Melody Music. Um, also, uh, what makes an appearance in there was there was a health food store on Harrison Street called uh, Harvest Village uh, that this elder, uh, older woman who we called the Carrot Lady because she just I think she drank so much carrot juice, she was orange. Uh, and, uh, but it was, it was this, this amazing old health food shop that was tiny. And they had a guy in there that we called the soup psychic that would make like soup uh, downtown. Uh, and he would, he, would, he would do like tarot card readings and stuff. Uh, uh, but it was a great place and we missed it. And it was really charming to see it in the movie again. Uh, one of the other things that makes an appearance in the movie, here's another shot of the diner and Sandra Bullock looking so young and not making a million dollars yet in a film. Uh, she, she plays a great part in it, but they, they filmed on 20th Avenue for a short period of time uh, in front of where another gym was uh, called uh, Body Tech. Uh, although I think Body Tech had moved and, and the building was empty, it ended up being a Spanish restaurant and, and uh, I think it's now a nightclub, I'm not sure. Uh, but they also, there was a, a, the, the, the uh, Robert Duvall character was a barber. So they shot a scene where the Robert Duvall and the Richard Harris character got in an argument and they shot in front of the Palm Barber Shop. And the Palm Barber Shop was there on 20th Avenue for over 60 years. Uh, Dewey Lapointe, Laporte was a barber that looked out that window for over 60 years. He finally had retired when he was 91 years old. He cut my hair from uh, 1989 to 2016 or something like that. Uh, but the amazing thing about that was, is they wanted a barbershop scene and Dewey's barbershop was like this amazing old looking barbershop. One of the chairs still sits in there. Somebody else owns the barbershop now, uh, but they rented out Dewey's shop and they had a scene with Dewey Laporte in there cutting hair on, and, the, and there was a street scene. So you could see uh, Dewey in there and uh, Dewey had informed me that it was the it was the best day he had ever had at the barber shop because they paid for a complete every a haircut for the entire day, you know, half an hour, and they rented his place out, and he was starring in a movie. Uh, I'm Dewey is probably ninety three. The last I spoke, he was still around. He was the most charming, interesting guy ever. Uh, I'm so glad that. I can honor Dewey at uh, uh, this. He, he was so great to talk to uh, in the barbershop. One of the other things that makes an appearance too is the old Anchor Inn, which was a bar 
that if you think the uh, the uh, octopus is is a bunch of morning drinkers, well, the Anchor Inn, they they really drank in that place. I think the people went from the Anchor Inn to Kelly's to the octopus. And so if any of those people are still alive, they're at the octopus now. So now I'm going to move on from film to music. And this is a picture of the uh, Diplomat Hotel. Uh, the Diplomat Hotel was uh, built in the 1959. Um, and it was called the Envoy at first. And then uh, it, was, it was owned and built by uh, Sam Friedland, who was a uh, supermarket tycoon. And then his son-in-law had taken it over, uh, Irving and Marjorie Cohen. And Irving and Marjorie Cohen were, they wanted to, to, to be very popular people. They, they, this was the first hotel that was built between Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale that was grand and had some, some big rooms in there for performances. And uh, uh, Miami Beach, obviously in the 60s um, and the 50s, Jackie Gleason was there. And then with the uh, Deauville, um, Frank Sinatra performed at the Deauville and the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show were at the Deauville. Um, so they wanted to, the, the Miami Beach was had its time that this was in the 60s. So um, uh, they had they had two places to have performances in this building. Uh, 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 the Cafe Crystal, which was about an 800 seat uh, dinner theater. And oh, why can't I remember the name of the other? Uh, place. It was a, a smaller performance area uh, called the, wasn't the rec room, uh, I'll remember in the end, uh, oh, the tack room, that's what it was called. And it was smaller and had a jazz setting to it. So over the years, they started booking like pretty amazing acts. So let's see how we can go here. All right, so this is a, 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 a outside version of it. And if you look, I don't think you can see my cursor, but on if you're facing the screen on the left, there is a rotunda looking building that's rounded with some portholes on the top. That was where Cafe Crystal was. And this is where you could get dropped off in the front and then you could go uh, inside. And this was a, an, a, an amazing room. So let's go through some of the people that that perform there. And uh, um, so the tack room, you could see that they would have uh, uh, ads for smaller people, and then they would have uh, uh, the bigger show. These prices, I don't know if they came with dinner or not, but I would think not, uh, because at 15 and 1250, uh, even back in the 1970s, that would not be proper. So here, this was a, a little earlier, uh, uh, Judy Garland performed. Connie Francis, uh, Peggy Lee, uh, Stephen Eady, uh, Tony Bennett, Buddy Hackett, pretty amazing. So this is this is uh, 1975, um, which is a year after what I'm going to show you next. But Sammy Davis Jr. and Liza Minnelli performed a New Year's Eve performance uh, at Cafe Crystal, and um, this was kind of early on for um, Liza Minnelli's live performances. She had done cabaret, but this was sort of the starting point for her to be able to like perform live shows. And they went across the country after this, uh, Sammy and Liza. And oddly enough, Judy Carlin performed in this building and her daughter performed in this building. And I can't remember her other daughter's name, Linda Luft, she had performed there also. I may have the first name wrong. So this is amazing. In 1974, Frank Sinatra came out of retirement. Uh, and until yesterday, I thought he came out of retirement just to perform at the Diplomat. They paid him $200,000 for a New Year's performance 
1974. Well, after I did some studying, it was the last performance of the retirement tour, not the first performance. But amazingly, he performed at Madison Square Garden during this tour, uh, large, large buildings all over. Uh, so for him to play at this 800, maybe 900 seat dinner theater for New Year's was amazing. And in 1974, uh, Frank Sinatra was trying to be, you know, uh, contemporary or hip. And uh, not that he never wasn't hip, of course he was very hip, but oddly enough, he included in his set, uh, Bad Bad Leroy Brown and uh, You Are the Sunshine of My Life by Stevie Wonder and these songs by Frank Sinatra were not his best. <laughs> but to end the show, as he always did, he said, now we are going to sing the national anthem. And he sang My Way, because My Way was Frank Sinatra's national anthem. So here are some other shows that happened there. And I think that this is amazing that Burt Baccarat was performing at Cafe Crystal and Betty Wright, Betty Wright is probably the soul queen of Miami. She had a giant song called The Cleanup Woman. And uh, she was uh, between soul and disco. And hats off to uh, the Cohen family uh, to have a Black performer. I know the 70s seems past segregation, but... Uh, this, this really touched my heart. I'm a giant fan of Betty Wright and to know that she was performing in the early 70s uh, at The Diplomat was amazing. Here's an ad for Connie Francis, Dionne Warwick. Uh, funny thing about this was that uh, with the help of um, Mary Beth down at the research center and uh, newspapers.com, we kept finding these advertisements and we kept cracking up at why is there an E on the end of Dionne Warwick's name? And uh, it ended up that she spelled her name two different ways. We never knew that. Here is a, a, a sort of newspaper clip about Judy Garland uh, performing there. At the time, she was supposed to play two dates, but she ended up just playing one. Uh, Engelbert Humperdinck, uh, who performed there who I had learned over the years, Engelbert Humperdinck is not his real name. I'm not sure why he would pick this name to be his stage name. And then ended up finding out that Engelbert Humperdinck actually was a famous composer, classical composer in I believe Germany, but definitely Europe. And he chose his name after him, <laughs> kind of weird. The fifth dimension, come on up, up and away. And my beautiful balloon. At the Diplomat. Pretty cool, huh? So the Diplomat had a fire in the mid 80s and uh, they really couldn't get back on their feet by 1987. And the Cohen family had finally, um, they had finally um, had to give up the, the, the building and, and sold it to someone else. The building got tore down in the 90s and, you know, with the reality, stuff like that doesn't happen at the Diplomat anymore. And we really have to, to, to love the Cohen family for doing that. The Osmonds perform there. So now we're gonna move on to Hemingway's. Hemingway's was, uh, is actually, was in the building, what, which was uh, Joseph Young's original uh, printing press where he could print uh, advertisement to, to, to rent, to, to sell property here. Uh, and all that very ex heavy printing material was in that building. So that building is made like a fortress. It ended up being city hall at one time, a police station. Uh, it also had a, a, a holding cell uh, for prisoners there. Well, by the 1960s, uh, Hemingway's was, uh, purchased by a family named uh, the Young family, oddly enough, but no relation to Joseph Young. And it was George and Audrey Young. 
and they both also had a love for jazz music and uh, music performers there. And uh, they had, it was sort of a dinner theater. And before it was Hemingway's, this, this was the Continental Bar and they did not have uh, as many performers there, but this would probably be the 1950s. And this was just before it became Hemingway's. And then this would be Hemingway's and we're guessing in the seventies, looking at that Cadillac on the side. Although it sure looks like there's a ship captain out front there, doesn't it? Uh, so this here is a picture of George and Audrey Young. And that is Lionel Hampton on the far right. Lionel Hampton is maybe one of the, the, the most famous vibe players uh, uh, ever. And um, in the top hat is Wayne Cochran. Uh, Wayne Cochran was the, and you know, I have to say this right now that uh, Clive Taylor has uh, uh, his windows open here. So I have to listen to all the comments from the crowd outside here. It's like I'm performing at a concert already uh, from the peanut gallery way, no way. Uh, so, but I love it. So Wayne Cochran was the, the, the white knight of soul. Wayne Cochran, uh, this is not, this was after this, he had found God by this time, but I think he wanted to just show up and see Lionel Hampton play. And he ended up running a church in, uh, in Miami Lakes, but uh, Wayne Cochran was sort of famous for the going back to Miami song. And uh, the Blues Brothers basically stole their stick, especially uh, Dan Aykroyd's character, like the dancing and all of that. Uh, was was a complete ripoff of uh, Wayne Cochran. Wayne Cochran did all these leg moves and it, it was amazing, you know. Uh, Elvis's return to Las Vegas when he was wearing uh, the, the white suit and all of that, that was also C.C. Ryder. He performed the song uh, that was Wayne Cochran. Uh, so Wayne Cochran had performed in this building also. Uh, he probably did more religious songs than he did all those old rock and roll songs, but uh, uh, it's amazing. I never knew Wayne Cochran played in this building, but it was amazing. I wish I did. I would have went there. Um, this here is John Williams. John Williams was a city commissioner here in Hollywood uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s. And I knew that he was a, a jazz performer and he, oddly enough, basically saved uh, Hollywood Beach uh, in, the, in the North area uh, from development uh, where Evans Street, all those streets are. Um, but I, I thought that he was a jazz aficionado, not like a performer. Well, John Williams was, a, a, he, he put out two records in the in the late 50s he played with charlie parker he was he was it man he was he was pretty amazing you know uh so this is a shot from uh inside hemingways where he played there and i will talk about john williams in a few minutes uh if if i if i show uh something in the screen like for instance here will you guys be able to see it too uh i don't know if you can or not it's not really showing up. Uh, not really. Well, that's one of John Williams's records. Uh, but we'll go with the pictures. I'm doing fine. So here is uh, Al Hibbler, uh, who sang Unchained Melody. And uh, uh, he performed with Duke Ellington and Count Basie. And he played with Lionel Hampton and Cannonball Adderley. He was also on Sesame Street, which to me is amazing. Uh, th that would be my dream gig is to play on Sesame Street. Uh, and this is in Hemingway's also. Uh, this is Joe Williams, who was a famous jazz and blues singer. Uh, this is also at Hemingway's. Um, uh, here are some more folks. Um, this is, uh, uh, I'm trying to think who this is here. Uh, I can't remember at the time, but it's obviously still George and Audrey Young, uh, the, the owners of the place. Uh, 
uh, supposedly, and I can't find any facts on this, but early on during the Miami Sound Machine, uh, they had performed there, uh, but I could not find any facts on that. Definitely Buddy Rich played here, the world's greatest drummer ever played in Hemingway's, and probably the most interesting uh, um, performer that had a regular gig there was Tiny Tim, Tiptoe Through the Tulips, Tiny Tim, uh, had like a regular gig there. And the first time that I had known this was my mother was a banker at Southeast Bank on Pembroke Road. And she kept telling me that Tiny Tim was one of her customers and would come in the line with his leisure suits and stuff like that. Um, so uh, this is uh, just uh, anniversary of them. They did make it up into the 90s, uh, but this is a nice ad for the place. Um, so more power to you. All right, now we're going to move on. Uh, now I want to talk about the Hollywood Jazz Festival. The Hollywood Jazz Festival was amazing, and it basically was due to John Williams, our commissioner, being a, a, a jazz musician. Uh, this is a picture of Kenneth Spry, who is the architect of the band shell that was there from the 1950s until, I'm gonna get there, Clive. I'm sitting in a Kenneth Spry house right now, although that Hollywood sign is not real. Uh, uh, but this building uh, was there from the 50s to the 70s. Uh, there was a band shell uh, to the 90s, excuse me, um, the 2000s maybe, it was up through the 2000s, um, but, uh, this, this was an amazing built mid-century modern. This building should have never been torn down, never. Uh, I'm gonna show you a picture of what it looked like previously in the 1930s and then the 50s. Uh, this is a postcard of what the original band shell looked like. So that was built in the 30s and that lasted to the 50s. And then this is a postcard of the band shell that Kenneth Spry had built. Uh, interesting enough, it did have a border and you could have seats in there so they could have uh, paid attendance. And um, this was very important. And now they're thinking about putting a fence back up into the park. And uh, it's sort of uh, questionable about all that. And the stage, although the Rhythm Foundation puts on some really great shows in, in the park, uh, that stage is just so giant and boring and it's like the world's biggest paddleball court out there where this look how beautiful that is you know this was an amazing place so the jazz festival uh ran from uh 1985 i believe here's here's another like uh aerial shot from the nighttime of the circle where it looks amazing you can see the great southern uh you can see uh, Moy's um, Chinese restaurant over there. Uh, and here's a daytime picture of just, look how great that is, you know? Um, so the Hollywood Jazz Festival started in um, 1982. And these were, um, these pictures, th these are posters that were supplied to the Hollywood Historical Society uh, that were a collection uh, that were just given to us from a former employee for WLRN, uh, Mia Lorenzo, and we appreciate them very much. So there's a few in a row here of the posters of the the Jazz Festival. So the Jazz Festival was uh, outside there from 1982 until 2002. So for 20 years, it was in the park. And uh, WLRN used to broadcast live and then the city did broke up with WLRN. So they put the events on and it was kind of slow uh, in the late eighties. And then 1991, it came back, it became a three-day festival and Dizzy Gillespie, Art Farmer and Iris Sullivan performed. And within those three days, it drew 50,000 people to the park and it was amazing. Uh, the following year in 1992, 
uh, Red Rodney and Esther Torres performed. In 1994, Sonny Rollins performed. In 1995, Jerry Mulligan, Charlie Hayden, and Joe Williams, who we saw who had also performed at Hemingway's, had performed at this event. In 2003, sort of became the demise of the Hollywood Jazz Festival. Uh, it moved to the Central Performing Arts Center, Hollywood Central Performing Arts Center, which is where Hollywood Central is. And they had one more grand year. And uh, uh, that was it. Uh, but it was amazing, and we really, uh, we really missed stuff like that going on. So let's see. All right. So now I'm going to move forward to some famous people that lived in Hollywood. So claimed by himself, the world's greatest bass player ever, and I can't deny he was not pretty amazing, basically the Jimi Hendrix of, of bass, uh, Jaco Pastoris. Uh, who is sort of known for growing up in Oakland Park uh, in the 1970s. Um, he lived on Cleveland Street and US 1. I will show you a picture of the building that he lived in. Uh, and he did also play in Wayne Cochran's band, which you're going to see one of those pictures too. Uh, and both of those times was sort of before he ended up becoming what he had become. Well, by this time, he did a benefit show in Young Circle, uh, which was in 1983, which was during the Word of Mouth tour, which is probably the most Floribian jazz record you could ever hear. It's, it's, it's Caribbean sounding, it's jazz, it's Jocko playing a lot of piano on it. Uh, if you want to seek out something of Jocko's where he's not throwing up all over the bass, don't get me wrong, he's great at doing that, but this record is beautiful, word of mouth. So he had performed there. This is the building now. Jocko used to live upstairs here in the early 70s uh, before he became a teacher at the University of Miami for a short period of time. There was a laundromat underneath him at the time, um, but this is, and this is on the corner of Cleveland and US-1. And this is, this is, Jocko is in the second row uh, with shorter hair. And he was a bass player only for about a year in Wayne Cochran's band, who I spoke to Eve uh, previously. And it looks like Wayne Cochran had one of the famous nudie suits that like all the country singers and stuff had. And now Wayne Cochran's hair is still way more 70s than he was in the late 60s. Wayne Cochran had this pompadour that was, uh, way up there made Dolly Parton look like she was bald. Uh, I mean, he, he, it was amazing. So, uh, uh, so now we're, we're going to move on to a famous, uh, musician that's from here. Uh, Tinsley Ellis Jr. Uh, is a guitar player who is still alive right now. His father was a very prominent attorney down here. Uh, and uh, Tinsley grew up off of North Lake, on, uh, excuse me, on South Lake, on North Lake Drive, on South Lake, uh, across from our dearly beloved Victor, uh, who is on the board. Uh, and Victor uh, told me about uh, Tinsley Ellis. Tinsley Ellis uh, is a blues guitar player, sort of a contemporary around the same time as Stevie Ray Vaughan. He did not get the, the accolades that Stevie Ray Vaughan did, uh, but an incredible sort of uh, rock and blues guitar player uh, still had performed down here in the last 15 or 20 years. He oddly enough went to college uh, with Peter Buck from REM and Peter Buck uh, helped out on one of his records. Uh, this record in general that uh, Peter Buck is on. So uh, Tinsley was someone who grew up here, eventually moved to Atlanta, Ariams from the Athens area, although they didn't go to the University of Georgia together. Uh, so he ended up pretty much staying in Atlanta, you know? Uh, this, this is just in line of my pictures. Uh, I don't, this is my, this is my grandfather uh, as a saxophone player in, um, 
in Edison High School's band. My grandfather was in the Shriners, the Hollywood Shriners band. Uh, and uh, the, the, the shrine fez I was wearing was his fez. Uh, so here's a, a, a picture of the Hollywood uh, Oriental Shrine Band. Uh, and then here is another great one. And it's just so great to see the Hollywood Florida sign. This is actually a golf screen, but they used to parade up and down uh, US one. My grandfather is the one uh, with the big bass drum there, although he was a saxophone player. Uh, that's just in there because I didn't realize we were, I'm just scanning through my pictures, so that's great. Oh, this is a great famous story. Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida. This is Luther Campbell from Two Live Crew on uh, 20th Avenue uh, on Dixie and Hollywood Boulevard in 1990, Two Live Crew were arrested for performing their Nasty As They Want To Be songs um, because there was an injunction that these dirty words were not allowed to be performed. Um, and the, the club was called Club Futura, the building's not there anymore, but Club Futura, the owner had made two shows and the two shows were an underage show where, they, where the band performed no dirty words and they made all clean lyrics. And then the second show, everyone had to sign a waiver and they had to be over 18 and they were allowed to witness the dirty show. And uh, I don't know why, and this is like some history that I need to find out that the Broward Sheriff's Department is who had come in and arrested these guys and the Hollywood Police Department did not. So I don't know how the uh, Nick Navarra uh, claimed jurisdiction to do this, but the, the best part of this story was Luther Campbell and Two Live Crew were exonerated from all of it because they didn't do anything that was illegal. And in the end, Luther Campbell has become a do-gooder. Uh, he was an optimist football coach at Liberty City Optimist for many years. And oddly enough, the book and my grandfather uh, playing in the marching band at Edison High School. Luther Campbell is now the head football coach for Edison High School in Little Haiti, and they have their best record they ever had. Although nasty as they want to be is probably the best record Luther Campbell ever had. Hey, where'd you go, Joe DiMaggio? Well, Joe DiMaggio, at the end of his life, moved to Hollywood. Uh, he actually lived at 1141 Waterside Lane. Uh, we all wonder why Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital is named after that. Well, when Joe DiMaggio had lived here in Hollywood, they had chose that they were going to make a donation. Joe DiMaggio was a uh, uh, big supporter of kids' health and this, that, and the other. Uh, so he ended up here. And I don't know if you all know or not, but every Friday night, Joe DiMaggio used to go down to the early bird special at Mamma Mia's and you could see Joe DiMaggio every Friday night on the circle at Mamma Mia's. And now since we're talking about eating and famous people in Hollywood, Jake LaMotta, Raging Bull. They made a movie after Raging Bull. Robert De Niro performed in there. Jake LaMotta lived at the end of his life in Hollywood, Florida, and he used to go to the Hollywood Country Club uh, and enjoy the lobster special over there uh, before he passed away. My band actually performed there once. Jake LaMotta was there and it tickled us pink. Uh, I'm glad that he probably couldn't hear much anymore because I'm not sure he would have liked the music, but he sure did like the lobster special. So that is that concludes my lecture. Uh, this is my band performing on Hollywood Beach on the world's largest um, uh, beach blanket. And uh, now I just got to figure out how to get out of here and answer all your questions. Do I left click Clive? Oh yeah. Um, oh, that's right. And so there we go. And then I can come out of here. Stop so. share. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Awesome.
Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I know there were lots of comments in the chat. And um, at this time, if you have any questions, uh, if you want to put them in the chat or raise your hand, Steve can answer them. Yeah, it could be better in the chat because I can't see everyone there. Uh, uh, how many viewers do we have, actually? There's, well, at one time, there's 43. There were 47 at one time. Very, very interesting. That's that's probably that's probably pretty good for a Zoom meeting, isn't it? That's excellent. Yes. You made you made me remember Melody Music. That's where we bought all our records when I was younger. And the carrot lady, she was a hoot. <laughs> she really was. And the guy who made the she soup. Was a hoot. You got you just there, went in hung. there for yeah, you just went in there for entertainment and carrot juice. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I think most of the most of the vitamins may have had penicillin in them too, but uh, it wasn't because it was in them. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Or something else. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I hope. Uh, I let me look if there's any questions over here on the side. A lot of you brought up a lot of memories for people, and um, Mia Lorenzo was talking about her father played in a band, I think at Hemingway's one time. I also see it was Lorna Luff that was uh, uh, Judy Garland's other uh, daughter. Uh, I do, I do uh, wanna thank also the Research Center, uh, Mary Beth and Leslie over there uh, had to be annoyed by me uh, many times coming over there and I would show up on a day and in between the times that I was there, they're like, oh, we stumbled across this. We weren't even looking for it, you know? And uh, this was really a pleasure for me to, I, I knew a lot of this history already, but I would open up a can of worms once a week and I would be like, oh, I'm gonna go practice music in my band room. And, uh, and I would go two hours, you know, stumbling uh, down a path even yesterday, like I said, with the Frank Sinatra coming out of retirement, I thought, oh my God, I can't believe that the Cohen family had like pulled him out of retirement. And then I start looking up, I'm trying to find like a 1974 performance afterwards. And it's like, oh wait, it was the end of the tour. Uh, but it's still amazing, 900 seat theater and they had Sinatra and he played at Madison Square Garden on the same tour. Uh, that's just out of this world, you know? Um, my high school class graduated from the diplomat. And I also uh, remember Tinsley Ellis. He used to play right over here on 24th and Hollywood Boulevard in a little club. And I worked for his father. My first job out of high school, he was a member of the law firm. Yeah, uh, that, that place was called One Night Stan. Stan was That's a sax it. player. That's mm -hmm. it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw, I saw, and, I saw NRBQ there. Uh, uh, when the brothers were uh, actually when Big Al was still in the band. So that was pretty amazing. Uh, there were some other things that like I, I, I thought about stumbling down, but I think one of them uh, really uh, has to do with uh, Emmanuel George's um, lecture next week. So I'm going to stay away from that one story. Uh, a couple of the other things, the Chitlin circuit was just on the edge of Hollywood. Uh, there was a club called the Paradise, which was just one block to the east in Dania. And then in Hallandale, there was the uh, Million Dollar Palms or the Palms. And these were part of the, the, the Chitlin era where Sam Cooke and Little Richard and James Brown uh, played in all these buildings. And in Liberia, um, uh, I, I think Emmanuel's uh, lecture is about addicts alone. So I think I can bring these two things up uh, that Sam Cooke played in a gospel band called the Soul Stirrers uh, before he did um, um, non-religious music, secular music. And they performed in one of the churches over there. And James Brown's aunt uh, lived in Liberia. And when James Brown would come to town before desegregation, he would stay at his uh, aunt's house. And the other thing that I wanted to sort of steer down, I come from like independent music and punk music and um, 
there were some pretty popular bands that that came out of the South Florida area. Dania is where a lot of them live, Charlie Pickett, uh, Robert Mascaro. Uh, but there was a club on Hollywood Beach called Tight Squeeze that uh, uh, a band called the Zed Cars played in and the Cichlids played in. And there was a bar on Dixie Highway called the Premier Lounge that uh, Charlie Pickett and the Eat uh, performed in these bars. And this was way before anyone was actually performing original music. You either, if you played in a bar or a club, unless you were a jazz musician, uh, although they usually played standards also, uh, you were playing other people's music. And this was uh, Tight Squeeze, which is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's right across from, uh, I, I hate keeping repeating Margaritaville, but at the t-shirt shop right across from uh, Margaritaville on that main road, that big building was where Tight Squeeze uh, was. And it was, it was groundbreaking. And, and, and they really drew, you know, hundreds of people to see this original music. Uh, so uh, I, I ended up looking, there wasn't many recording studios in Hollywood. They ended up being in Fort Lauderdale and Dania and Miami, but uh, it is worthy to mention that these two places were also uh, Hollywood related and, and, and very groundbreaking for the time. Do we have any more questions for Steve? Can I, can I just talk? Can I? Oh, of course. Right in in the I mean, yeah. What about, hi, what about Pirate's World? Weren't there groups playing in Pirate's World? Was that considered Hollywood? Pirate, Pirate's World is Dania. And oh, okay. Pirates, but Pirate, I mean. There are a lot of groups. There. Every, I'll, I'll even, I'll just give you a lowdown with Pirate's World. Led Zeppelin played at Pirate's World. Alice Cooper, David Bowie, um, uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe how many people played at Pirate's World. And they, the guy who owned Pirate's World also did um, uh, like B movies. And there's a movie called The uh, Musical Mutiny that they filmed a little bit at Pirate's World, but there are some scenes in downtown Hollywood. And it was, uh, I had confused this one scene um, with, 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 the, with the bus scene in, uh, uh, Midnight Cowboy, and I did forget to bring up in Midnight Cowboy also, uh, uh, Rasta Rizzo's last meal was purchased at the Dunkin' Donuts on Young Circle uh, in the film. Uh, but I, I had always thought that the there was a bus scene in Midnight Cowboy. Well, they're only on the bus. They don't stop at the bus stop, but in this musical Mayhem, there is a bus scene. And I always thought that there was only a Greyhound bus station on the north side. But on the south side, southwest side of the circle, there was the Twi Trailways bus station. And Greyhound and Trailways were two different buses until Greyhound had bought them out. And then they closed down the uh, Trailways. And it would have been like on the front end of where Doctor's Hospital is. Uh, and you would pull in there, and, that, and that's where that is. So there is a little connection with the Pirates world and the, and the filming there. Uh, a couple of things that I kind of forgot to bring up too about with Cape Fear is that there was a scene uh, that was a lake and the lake that they had filmed at was off of Sterling Road and the Turnpike, which is technically Hollywood. Um, uh, they did film in the parking lot at Presidential Circle there too. Uh, uh, but other than that, and, and the one thing I definitely want to bring up is I had for many years, wanted to uh, clandestine paint Hollywood stars on Hollywood Boulevard with all the names of people that were movie stars that were in Hollywood. Uh, I never got to doing that, but now since I am uh, not as much of an anarchist as I was then, I think, I'm not sure, uh, I, have, I have put in um, a request to the CRA and the, um, the mural program to maybe make some stars on Hollywood Boulevard for all the different people uh, that were on there. I may have not got a response back because I did request one for Luther Campbell from Two Live Crew too, but I think he deserves one. Uh, um, but, uh, and then I had also come up instead of doing them so they look like the ones in Hollywood that we could put them on starfish instead of stars so they could be the walk of fame of 
the Hollywood starfish. Uh, so I need to press that issue a little more, uh, but, and I need all of your support to, uh, to, to get this to happen. Uh, but I think it would be great. There's so many, I mean, just the people that were actually filmed on Hollywood Boulevard would, would do numbers from Jessica Lang to Robert De Niro to, you know, Dustin Hoffman, uh, John Voight, Luther Campbell. Uh, but we could also even sporadically put some over near the diplomat, over near Hemingway's on Harrison Street. I think, I think it, it would be super cool. That sounds very good. Any other questions? Do you have your hand up, Lynn? Yes, I just, um, I sent a chat, but what I wanted to, you didn't touch on today, but there, I've been hearing rumors for years that the only reason that Hollywood, California is Hollywood, California and Hollywood's not Hollywood is because of the hurricane. And then they decided that they didn't like our our liability with hurricanes. Is that something true when your investigation? I, I've been hearing it for years, so I don't know if it's true. Hollywood, California got it only because we got a hurricane and then they didn't like, they decided oh, you that. Mean, oh, you mean the film For the film, in, for the film industry, uh, yes. I, I believe the film industry had started already there. Uh, actually, from some studying, Jacksonville was sort of the East Coast of the film industry. Uh, before Hollywood, Florida, uh, Hollywood, California was. Uh, and uh, it seemed to have moved there before 1926. So maybe they were thinking of some of that, but uh, from my studies, it had seemed that the, the silent films were definitely starting before 1926. So uh, I, think, I think we may have, uh, although when we incorporated in 1925, we claimed ourselves as Hollywood instead of Hollywood by, by the sea. So I don't, I don't know if we lost that part of our name at that time, but uh, um, uh, and that's something to investigate. I, 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 I've like heard that, that. For, for years and people have told me when I first moved to Hollywood that that's what happened. Of course, because there was a hurricane and they were planning to build the studios because there were some studios here, some big studios years ago that were ones in the North Miami and there was a couple of one, there was actually even one a big studio off of um, Griffin Road in the back there. So there was a lot of things here, but that's the rumor that I heard and nobody's ever verified that. So I was, I thought maybe you would be able to have found something, but obviously not. I could, I could ask Clive, but he's enjoying his company out <laughs> on his patio and, and they're drinking champagne, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Hollywood as a film industry, Lynn Smith, uh, they, they weren't sure if Hollywood was going to be a film industry here, and then the 26 hurricane happened and it just went to... Not, I've never heard that Hollywood was going to be a film mecca. I did hear that when Joseph Young came here in the early 20s, that Hollywood was not a film mecca, that it was actually Long Beach, California, that was doing a lot of the silent movies. So the, the idea that we could have rivaled Hollywood, California at that time, I, I don't think so because- but there was no Hollywood, there was no, there was, it wasn't really, when it happened, it was supposedly before the Hollywood, California got built that they were talking about doing Hollywood um, as a film mecca. And then we had her, and I don't even know if it's the 1926 hurricane. Then we had a hurricane. It would have and been then the 1926 they, hurricane. Yeah. That changed everything. Yeah. So I, I have to, I, if Steve didn't find as, anything, that, that's probably not true, but that's what I heard from you. And Lynn, as, as, as Clive stated, Long Beach was already a place that they were making films. So Long Beach was in California. So it was going to be a lot easier to move those studios down the way. Which, by the way, that's where Joseph Young was developing was Long Beach before he came that's to interesting. Hollywood, yeah. Florida. He was interesting. Okay. I think, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to lose the connection. So okay. thank you, everybody, for coming. Steve, you did an amazing job. Thank you. Lots of information, lots of questions in the chat that we've been opening. And thank you so much. I, I just wanted to remind everybody, February 13th, Emmanuel George, 
uh, is going to be our speaker. We've had him several times in the past. Everybody loves him. He's a film director and historian. Uh, it's stories from our ancestors, the almost forgotten stories from Attics High School, which is in the Liberia area. So check in with us, sign up, and I hope you had a wonderful time. I sure did. Remember the carrot lady. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you so much, Clive. And Thank you, Clive. Uh, Clive, I know it's not Clive. Sorry. He's here.